I think the first thing in my mind that indicated I had an entrepreneurial way about me was when I was practicing law with my father, a very well-known prominent trial lawyer. And uh, I didn't particularly like law school, but I, back in those days, you did sort of what your father did. And, and here I got through law school somewhere or other. And even though I sold encyclopedias the whole time and maxed out as far as the number of hours you're allowed to work. But uh, when my brother-in-law uh, called me in, who was also in the firm, the firm was Brown and Son, and uh, he was a little bit envious, I think, of uh, the business I was getting as my father's son. And he said, uh, John said, people are talking around town that you're riding your dad's coattails. So I said, well, the hell with that, you know. So I went to my dad, I said, look, let me go to Louisville. I'll open up for the office there. And I'm gonna call it Brown and Father, okay? <laughs> we reversed it. <clears throat> now Martin Dale is like the encyclopedia of, of all, or, or the yellow pages of all law firms. It was the only one in there that had the father as the second gun. And so anyway, that was an instinct. And then after practicing law for like a year and a half, I said, you know, I don't like this. I said, how do you make money? And from there, it sort of led me in to looking at detergents or car washes, or how do you get into be an entrepreneur? And out of all that environment, after about six months, I got a lucky phone call from Colonel Sanders. that changed my whole business career. It all started when uh, I was a senior in high school, and a couple of my buddies and I, we were looking around for a job. We were driving around, went all the way to Little Rock, Arkansas, and. When I got home, my mom, after we'd been gone about a month, said, uh, son, uh, we were sitting in the backyard with the family, said, uh, son, uh, did you get a job? I said, no, mom, we really tried. Said, the best job we could get was uh, at a pea factory in Little Rock, uh, making a dollar an hour. And she wasn't in a particularly good mood that night. And under her breath, she said, well, you're not worth a dollar an hour. And boy, that hit me, made me mad. And that Monday morning, I looked in a newspaper like the one ads, you know, where do you get a job? And I saw a little squib in there, a few inches of talking about Encyclopedia Britannica. If you knocked on the doors 50 times, they would guarantee you $100 a, uh, $100 a week. And I said, gee, I'm gonna try that. And I was all nervous. And when I went into the little office out here on Broadway, they had about four people in the hallway waiting their time to be interviewed. And I'm sure they would have hired anybody. But I remember the one that interviewed me, uh, uh, Sal Canova, uh, Colova rather, uh, he challenged me and one of the most important things uh, that you look for is experience, is it personality, is it whatever, uh, or is it desire? And I gave him the right answer. I said, well, it's a desire. And he called me a couple of days later, told me I'd been selected. <laughs> no one in hindsight either would have taken anybody who'd come in and take the satchel. And so I went in and I learned whatever the speech was, or the spiel you might call it, uh, in a week. And I went out that week, and I swear, the first weekend I sold five sets of books, made $99 a book. And you know, they pay $10 a month for like three years and $300. And so that's what really gave me, and then I became a real zealot. I said, I've got something I can do well. You know, it's a long story, but a great entrepreneurial story. I think the greatest entrepreneurial story when you think, here's a man at retirement age, and he's fooling around in his garage and comes up with a pressure cooker, how to cook chicken, and has some leaven herbs and spices that he fills around with and comes up with that recipe and changed the eating habits of the world. So I was very fortunate to be at the right place at the right time and fortunate to have the background that could relate to his kind of business because I was a lawyer. And you can imagine 600 different people having this recipe and all of a sudden they find this is important to them and it was gold in their hands, so they were difficult uh, to work with, as, as they should be. And uh, my background selling, which related to marketing, because the Colonel became the most famous person in the world. I got him on TV, uh, on What's My Line, to start with, and then it ended up about 30 TV shows over the nation of the next three, or three, or three and a half, four years. So it launched our business. Uh, a lot of learning experiences. and. The thing that helped me the most is I didn't know any better. And I didn't try to change the kernel. I just stuck with what he had and expanded a little bit, changed it, and now it's a world icon in the rest of the business. He was a man with a great imagination and, uh, and sort of fearless, didn't mind failing. And uh, he just started out with an idea. And there's the old saying, uh, 
Oh, what was the man's name that wrote, uh, nothing so powerful as an idea and time has come, it was Victor Hugo. And that's what this was. He had an idea whose time had come. And it just exploded because we had no competition. And finally, after about four or five years, we had churches and Bojangles and Pie Pies, and they were eating into our business. And I decided at that time that we better, you know, capture the moment. And we opened 860 stores in one year in 1968, I believe it was, four years after we bought the company. And mainly it was the franchisees. They became our partners. They understood, they loved the product, the whole concept. And so we had an army of people to go out there and put our flag in the ground and capture the moment. And all the other companies ended up going bankrupt that were our competition at that point. And I didn't know what he did. You know, a man in a white suit and a little bit different, you know. And I didn't know if he worked out of his basement or what kind of deal he had going on. And I didn't go see him for six months. And uh, so I saw him at the the colonel's by the Kentucky Derby breakfast the governor has every year. And, and I was a little embarrassed because I hadn't gone by. And I said, Colonel, I'm gonna come see you. So the next week I did. And he started telling me about Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he said, come on, Johnny, go scrub, sir. I'll show you uh, how we make money. And he had a big file drawer, about 600 uh, licenses to give out. He'd go in uh, a restaurant and knock on the door and say, let me cook you some chicken, buddy. And if you like it, I'll give you a license. And out of that, he had about 600 restaurants where it was an item on the menu. Yeah, he'd be down at the corner, have his picture, and, and have, you know, eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. And so uh, when I saw those checks, uh, some of them be $100 a month, 150 200 And I said, this is fascinating. And he said, come on, Johnny, I'm interested in starting a barbecue franchise. And so I drove with him over to Frankfurt and looked at what they call the Pink Pig. And one thing led to another, and that night I tried his chicken. I'd never eaten it before. It was fabulous. And I thought, I'm gonna find a cedar out here. I mean, there's something here. And I said, Colonel Hill, let me be a partner with you and start this barbecue franchise. I'm a lawyer and salesman by, by background, marketing, and we'll be 50-50 partners. And doggone if he didn't give me a contract to be his partner in the barbecue business. And we had an exclusive to use KFC. <laughs> well. My wife did the curtains and uh, I went next to a graveyard and across uh, next door to a funeral home and cross street from a graveyard, my first location, which had failed three times of the other businesses, but it was cheap enough for me. And uh, so we finally got it open and had a big fireplace with a fire roaring and the ribs and the barbecue. And the problem was we did 80% chicken, 20% barbecue. So I knew I was in the wrong end of the right business by luck. There's a lot of luck in business. And I remember going to Harvard Business School. I think I've told you this story uh, that I wondered, what can I learn? What can you teach me up here in a summer course where I can know how to go back and run a company? I never read a balance sheet or p and L, and this was all new. And I thought I'm going to go to the experts. And I spent about an hour talking to about 11 associate professors in the George D. Baker School in Harvard. And uh, they were saying, you know, what's franchising and chicken and what are you doing? And I told them, that, you know, we, they never heard of us up there in the East because the Colonel didn't trust the Yankees. You know, we were mostly in the South and the West. And after about 30 minutes, one of them asked me, so Mr. Brown, how are your sales? And I said, well, we've gone from uh, about uh, $3 million a year to a little over $100 million this year. And this is like our second year. And they looked around at each other, and one of them with a sort of frown like a professor would, well, what about your profits? And I said, well, we've gone about 300,000 pre-tax to a little over 10 million pre-tax. And the host just smiled and said, Mr. Brown, why don't you go on back and keep doing whatever you're doing? Don't let us confuse you. So that's the first time I realized there are no experts, there are no geniuses. We happen to know more about our business at that particular time than anybody else. And since we were a novel of chicken and carry out, we didn't have, I didn't know who to go to to get advice. And in hindsight, you go to people that have been there and done that. And uh, I told my son Lincoln that read all you can about the people of wisdom, people that have accomplished things, how they did it, and, and what path they went on. That's where your real learning experience is. Everything I've ever learned before the internet world came into being was just asking questions. When I ran for governor, I didn't know how many cabinets there were. Came off my honeymoon, you know. They, they, uh, we asked 119 people to write the deadline before you had to sign up we're going to do it. 
And uh, we called 119 people. No one said, my wife, Phyllis George, who I just married. And I had a chance to, to win. Don't let Johnny embarrass himself. Well, the more they told us we couldn't do it, the more we said, well, we'll just show you, you know, just bring it on, you know. And fortunately, you know, we were center stage. And six other candidates were running and uh, they were bored, knocking on doors for four years, same old subject matter. So we were new and fresh. Everything in life's a matter of marketing at the end of the day. And uh, I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. Remember uh, the president of the University of Tennessee gave me a, a, a given a speech that I was impressed with, Andy Holt. He said, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are. So you can learn something. And uh, second, uh, learn to listen to your people. If you don't, you're going to be limited to your own mindset. And so listen to people. You know one person is going to know all the answers. And the third thing that I think is, is so incredible we learn is uh, let them spread their wings. You think what Ken Taylor did coming to me for a job, 40,000 a year, and now he's running a three and a half billion dollar company. Uh, that's really, I think, the most successful in our industry in this point in time. And the fourth thing is uh, you can't be a little bit honest, a little bit dishonest. You're the one or the other. You can't cut corners. You can't shade it here and not shade it everywhere. So uh, that was a message I'll always remember. And another one about business is uh, uh, I think uh, someone, a CEO of, of uh, <clears throat> Coca-Cola said, in business, you give a little, take a little, don't break up the game. So don't be greedy, play the game, build it around people because everything you do is going to relate to people, whether it's your supplier, it's your vendor, whether it's your employees, whether it's your family, uh, you're in the people business. And uh, I think uh, before you take a risk, be sure you can cover the risk. Uh, you don't go chase a dream until you're ready, prepared to handle it. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the key to being successful is being prepared for the opportunity when it comes. If you look back over the last hundred years of our American history, we've had a crisis most every decade. Going into the 20s, we had World War I and, and the, the drift in our economic base. And then in the 30s, we had the Great Depression, 40% unemployment. Uh, in the 40s, we had World War II and the atomic bomb. Any three of these decades could demolish the opportunity that we now enjoy in a country called America today. Uh, in the 50s, we went into the Korean War, finished that decade, mind you, with 91% high tax rates. In the 60s, we lost our beloved president with a, by being assassinated, followed by Martin Luther King. Finished that decade with the longest war in our history in the Vietnam War. We go into the 70s, we have our president resi resign in shame. Uh, and then uh, we finished that decade with 22% interest, 20% inflation, 11% unemployment, the worst economy since the Great Depression. In the 80s and 90s, we had the savings and loan debacle and where our entire financial communities were disrupted. We went into the years of 2000 and we had a couple of wars and our deficit has gotten out of hand. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what happened? Well, what happened is the younger generation, many of us here have monitored what's going on in our midst. The younger generation will come along and solve the problems that we have in the past. And the younger generation today is the most dynamic, the most creative, and the most innovative in a generation in my lifetime. They have allowed a level playing field with the internet and modern communication. Everything in life is based on information and knowledge is power. And when, in my day and when I went to school, uh, you'd have to ask three people to call three other people to find an answer to something. Or uh, to get a job, you, you'd ask for work and you get on. Today, the world is your oyster. You can look up on the internet and find an opportunity anywhere, everywhere. And it's a level playing field for opportunity in all countries that never had it before. So you talk about the future, as Warren Buffett says, the greatest future we've ever had. I love being an entrepreneur. Uh, I love the chance to be creative, to challenge. It's a very exciting life, a lot of stress. The easiest job I ever had was being governor of Kentucky because you don't have any competition and you don't have to make a profit. So that's another venture that I did later in my life, but my whole life has really been one as an entrepreneur to challenge what's going on and to see if you can figure out a better way to do it. And uh, I wouldn't trade that opportunity for anything that 
I could have done it in my life.